Hi everyone and welcome. Thanks for coming to this talk. Today we will be talking about IBUS and how can we use IBUS to seamlessly transition from Pandas to Spark. So first thing first, because I work for a financial advisor, I need to clarify that this talk is for educational purpose only and not to provide any financial advices. This should become pretty obvious. Okay, let's get started. First, I wanna talk about target audiences who might find this talk useful. Here are a few examples. If you like pandas, but want to analyze larger data set, if you're interested in using a distributed data frame, but don't know which one to choose, or if you want to have your analysis code run faster and or more scalable without making code changes. If any of these questions seems to apply to you, Stay on and hopefully this talk will give you some answers. So a quick introduction about me. My name is Li Jing. I am a software engineer working for a technology firm called Two Sigma. At Two Sigma, we apply technologies like computer science, statistics, and machine learning to investment management. My team at Two Sigma is called Modeling Tools. And our mission is to provide the best modeling experience for data scientists at Two Sigma. Our team loves to use open source softwares and I have contributed and worked on many uh, open source softwares and projects. For example, Apache and Spark and Pandas, we should be all pretty familiar with those. Apache Arrow is a relatively new one. It is a cross uh, language in memory data format. Flint is a time series and a uh, library on top of Apache Spark. And of course, the topic we're talking about today, uh, Ibis. So I wanna motivate, motivate my talk by start looking at a pretty common data science task. So here are some pens code. Um, we, should be, we should all be pretty familiar with these, but I'm gonna to walk through it. Uh, with you together. The first thing we're doing here is doing a simple um, column operation. We're taking two columns, V1 and V2, average those and assign it to a new column called feature. The second thing we're doing here is a window operation. Basically, we're grouping our data by the, another column called key. And for each key, we compute the rolling mean of the column feature and then we assign it back to this column called feature two. And finally, we're doing a group by aggregation on the column feature two by you know, grouping by key and compute the max and the main of, of, of um, this column. So the code runs pretty good on small, amount, small amounts of data. However, if you use pandas on median to large size, size data set, you will know that at some point, the code is going to be too slow. And there are a couple of reasons for it. First, Pandas is not designed for large amounts of data in the first place. Pandas is created more than 10 years ago when the data size is much smaller than, than those of today. And architectural Pandas stays more or less the same over the past 10 years. So it doesn't evolve um, together with the data size. The second, reason is your machine probably doesn't have enough RAM to hold all the data. Because Pandas is a in-memory single machine solution, it is required that you have uh, enough memory to hold the data in order to process it. And the third reason is you are not using all the CPUs. Modern machines usually have more than one CPU and Pandas for the most part is a single thread library. So you're not using, even for local machines, you're not using all the cores you can. So we want our code to run faster or to be able to process larger data set. So what do we do? Here we're going to try a few things to see if that helps. The first thing we're going to try is to use a bigger machine. After all, this seems pretty easy to do. Getting a bigger machine these days is not all that hard. And it has a very compelling reason. There is no code changes. You're running the same code with uh, just a beefier machine. However, this approach obviously won't get you very far, obviously. For example, you still have the same software limits of using pandas on single thread. 
So although you might be able to crank through a large data set given enough time, it is not going to be very fast. The next thing we try naturally is to use a distributed system. After all, distributed systems seems to be a good answer to uh, a lot of the big data uh, problems. The first approach we're going to try here is to use a generic way to distribute our code. This means that the system that distributed the computation does not know what the computation is trying to do and treat it as a black box. There are a lot of ways to do it. Here I'm using uh, Spark as an example. And uh, the advantage of uh, here I'm doing, uh, assuming I'm analyzing time series data of 20 years, here I'm using Spark, uh, Spark function parallelize to split my data into one year pieces and then send out to the cluster. So each executor can process one year uh, at a time and therefore achieve um, a parallelism of 20. The approach of this, uh, uh, the benefit of this approach is that it requires very small code changes. You might need to refactor your code a little bit to deal with one subset of the data at a time and then stitch back the result. But it doesn't require a total rewrite of the pandas code. It's also pretty scalable. By shorting your data into smaller pieces, you can achieve a very high level of parallelism. However, the disadvantage of this approach is also pretty clear. It only works for, for embarrassingly parallel problems. And in real life, a lot of the pandas code, they're not embarrassingly parallel. For example, in the, exam, uh, in the cases that we showed before, we have a window operation and a group by aggregation operation in our example and neither of which are in embarrassing parallel. In the window case, for example, we need to handle the boundary cases of a window goes across multiple time shards. And in a group by uh, cases, we also need to handle the case where a group, a group operation might need data from multiple shards. And also because now we're using a distributed solution, we are open ourselves to distributed failures. The next approach we're going to try to take is to use an actual distributed um, data frame library. Different from the second approach, this one actually, the framework uh, is actually aware of what you're trying to do. There are a couple of uh, distributed libraries available on the market, Spark being a very obvious one. Dask is another one that's just popular in the Python landscape, Koalas being another one which is um, pretty new and interesting. The advantage of all these is those are all pretty scalable. They're designed to handle large amounts of data and utilize many CPUs and memories. However, the benefit of uh, the, dis the disadvantage of this approach is also pretty uh, important, which is it involves a very high human cost. The user needs to learn a, a totally new API that is different from Pandas and probably need to rewrite a lot of analysis code to use a new API. And the second problem with this is there's not obvious um, answer of which one to use. If you ask me today if I should use uh, Spark or Dask or Koalas, honestly, I don't have an answer for you because that really depends on your situation. And combined with the first cost of high human cost of learning a new API, this actually becomes a, 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 a worse problem. And lastly, we still open to distributed failures. So we look at three approaches. They all have the advantages. They solve subset of the problem, but none of those seems to be a silver bullet, uh, a silver bullet here. So what should we do? In order to get maybe a new perspective, I want us to step back and uh, rethink our problem here. So let's take a step back and look at uh, the previous pandas code. I think we're pretty okay with the code itself. It's not that we think the code is hard to read or write. It's actually pretty reasonable to express what it's trying to do, but we just want the code to run faster or handle larger data. So this brings us uh, to our problem. The problem is not, just to rephrase it, the problem is not how we express the computation, but how we execute it. However, two out of the three approaches we look at involves changing the way we express the computation. 
which is not the problem we're trying to solve here. So something seems off. Why is it required to change the way we express the computation in order to make it faster? Right, that seems a little bit strange. So next, I want to bring out this design principle called separation of concern from Wikipedia. In computer science, separation of concern is a design principle for separating a computer program into disjoint sections, such that each section addresses a separate concern. How does this help us? Well, by applying this approach to our problem, we can um, separate how we express the computation, aka the expression part, with how we execute it. The reason we want to separate this is that the high cost of changing the, the way the code is, is purely involved in the exp uh, with the expression part, and the part we want to improve are actually the execution. So we can not, so by separating these, we can maybe get to a solution where it does not require changing of the expression part and the only improved execution. So this is actually not a new idea. For example, SQL is an excellent example of doing this. SQL is a way of separating expression from execution. It is powerful not because SQL is fast. It's powerful because you can make your SQL query run faster, for example, by switching from Hadoop to Spark without changing your expression layer, aka the SQL query. I think I'm kind of crazy to ask you to stop using pandas and Spark and all the nice data frame APIs and go back to SQL. Is this doesn't make sense. However, I want to I do want to ask the question of if we can come up with something that is similar to um, SQL but more suited for Python data science. So that will conclude the first section of the talk where we, um, we talk about concepts like expression and uh, ex execution, separation of concern. Next, I want to switch gear and talk about IBIS. With IBIS, these ideas of separation of concern gets materialized into software libraries. And here is the outline for the rest of the talk. I will first talk about IBIS at a very high level. Then I will go deeper into the two piece of uh, the two key component of IBIS, the expression and execution. And finally, we're going to see a little bit of implementation of the PySpark backend, which uh, I personally contribute to. So let's get started. So what is IBIS? IBIS is a open source library in Python. It started in 2015 by Wes McKinney, which is the creator of Pandas. And IBIS has been worked on by many top um, Pandas committers. Aside from that, IBIS also has community engagement with uh, other database developers like um, BigQuery, Impala, and uh, Spark in community as well. So IBIS has two major components, maps to the concept we talked about before. The first being the IBIS language. This is the API that is used to express the computation using IBIS. The second part is IBIS backend. These are modules that can translate the IBIS expression to something that can be executed by different backends. For example, IBIS now supports a, a list of backends. These are some examples. IBIS.pandas is a single node um, backend that uh, that executes IBIS expressions using pandas. This is similar to a, you know, in-memory database, if you will. Uh, IBIS PySpark is the one that, of course, executes IBIS expression on PySpark. And there's also a BigQuery one, which you can just use Google Cloud BigQuery with IBIS to run um, code with BigQuery. OmniSideDB is a particularly interesting one, in my opinion. It is a GPU database. So um, that is very different from what we uh, normally use. But still with the same API. So let's go a little bit deeper into the language part. It, it has a table API. The IBIS table API is very, familiar, is very similar to what we're familiar with as the DFM API. For example, it has projection, filter, drawing, et cetera. These are the very common SQL, uh, standard SQL operations. 
And I was also comes with a little bit extension to SQL. For example, as of join is a particularly useful function to deal with time series data. If you use pandas merge as of, you will know what I'm talking about. UDF being another one. And the second piece of the language is IBIS expression. These are uh, things that we can think them as abstract syntax trees. So these are intermediate representation um, of the table API. Users don't need to directly interact with those, but those are very useful for the developers to uh, implement the backends. The second um, here is just a quick example of the language. Here I'm using a table.mutate. This is similar to a with column function in PySpark to create a new column. And here I'm just showing a visualized version of the abstract syntax tree, which is pretty straightforward. And the backend takes what we have before, the abstract syntax tree, and uh, translate that to a specific backend expression. For example, in the pandas case, it will use df.assign, and in the PySpark case, it will use uh, df.withColumn to do that. So that's a very high level overview. Hopefully, that gave you um, some idea of uh, what panda, oh, sorry, what IBIS is and trying to do. And next, let's go into a little bit deeper into uh, specific parts. This is our, uh, the same example that we showed before. This is the pandas code we had before. And next, I'm. And next, I'm going to show a line by uh, a side by side comparison between the pandas code and the ibis code. So this is the first um, part. This is doing this um, create a new column operation. As you can see, this is pretty similar. Nothing is uh, too surprising here. And next, let's see uh, the window operations. This uh, is the pandas version of that. Here I'm calling a pandas rolling operation. And the corresponding IBIS code is a little bit actually like the PySpark code for that. Here we're creating an IBIS window object corresponding to the rolling and group by. And then we're calling uh, the co um, feature column dot main dot over the window object. This is very similar to, again, this is very similar to the PySpark uh, window operation. And finally, let's look at the group by operations. It's actually a relatively straightforward translation. Uh, the only difference is in pandas, you have this max and main string to represent opera or the operator, whereas in IBIS, you have uh, your specific function calls. So the code looks pretty similar. This is the final translation. Although the code looks really similar, there is a very important concept I want to emphasize here. Here, the IBIS code is purely expression, meaning that it is not uh, associated with any data or any execution backend. This is a, a more abstract idea from the pandas data frame, which is this is pure function or pure way of expressing the computation. And by plug this uh, IBIS expression with a specific backend and real data, we can easily execute it. And that's the material, that's the implementation of the idea of separation of concern. Now let's look at a little bit of uh, into the backend uh, execution part. So pandas, oh, sorry, IBIS come up, comes with different backends and each backends have a client. Here are just a few examples of creating those clients. They're usually pretty lightweight. For example, to use the PySpark client, you're just passing the PySpark session. And if you use Impala, for example, you just give it a server and port name, maybe username or something like that, but it's pretty lightweight and straightforward to use. And to get the table from IBUS here, I'm just showing you one way of doing it. There are other ways to do this as well. Here I'm referencing a table by name. This is similar to PySpark where you can register a data frame with a name in a catalog. In IBIS, there's a similar concept of that. So I'm just getting a name table called foo and assigned to a variable. Again, if I'm using PySpark client, I will just do uh, use PySpark client to get the table. And here's the 
abstract syntax tree node for this table foo. Nothing, nothing fancy here. Next, uh, once we have the table and the backend, we can execute it. Again, there are multiple ways of executing an expression. The simplest way of being uh, executing it into a pandas data frame. This is very useful um, to just play with it. However, there's also functions, for example, the PySpark backend allows you to compile or turn a IBIS expression into a Spark data frame, also which, which can hold much larger data than a pandas data frame, obviously. So if we recall our table transformation before, we can wrap it up in a function called transform, which takes a IBIS expression and return another uh, IBIS expression. And we can, uh, in this way, we can use it on multiple backend. Here, for example, I can, if my table is uh, associated with pandas backend, um, this will be pandas. And if it's PySpark, it will be PySpark. So pretty straightforward. And um, again, to emphasize my table and the result table, they are expressions, not data frames, meaning they are more flexible to be plugged in with multiple back uh, with different backends. And finally, we can execute it and let's see the result. This is very similar to uh, the two pandas function in PySpark, actually. Yep. Um, there's that, just a tiny bit of data. So the final part of this talk, I want to um, talk about the PySpark backend in IBIS. I picked this backend because first, this is Spark Summit, so that seems the most relevant. And second of all, this is uh, my contribution to IBIS, so I'm pretty excited to talk about it. But keep in mind that there are many backend in IBIS that are contributed by um, various communities. So just to um, remind ourselves, the backend um, goal is to turn the IBIS um, expression into a native uh, expression in the backend. In this case, we're trying to take the IBIS expression and turn that to a PySpark data frame. First, let's, talk at, uh, let's take a look at the, how does that work for a simple selection and arithmetic expression. Expression itself is pretty simple. We're doing a mutate and addition of two columns and take um, the main of those by uh, division. Let's go to, uh, this is showing you the abstract syntax tree for this uh, user code. At the bottom, we have uh, our source table uh, and one layer above that, we have two table columns, V1 and V2. And on top of that, we have two binary operations, addition and division. So this is very similar to, well, I guess any abstract syntax tree. So the way that the backends are implemented or you will have, um, you will register a specific method to compile a specific node. For example, here we register a function called compile divide to uh, explicitly translate the division node in the abstract syntax tree. And this works recursively. It's, um, let's go to the next slide. Here, T is a PySpark translator. This is a um, just uh, internal class of this um, backend. What this does is uh, it has a translate method that can evaluate this expression and turn that into a PySpark object. This will actually invoke the corresponding um, register method and dispatch uh, on, the, on the input type. Next, we have expert, which is the IBIS expression object, obviously. And uh, let's go next. The scope is the dictionary that caches the intermediate result, which is for performance reasons. So the way this works is we will um, recursively translate this node by translating its left and right um, children here. And then after we um, translate the left and right, um, we just um, Finish the, here. Left and right are uh, the corresponding result of the translation, which are PySpark columns, which is uh, pretty important. And then once we have those PySpark columns, it's straightforward to use the PySpark column division to finish the translation. So let's just walk through this real quick. Once we hit the left node, we're going to translate the addition um, operand here, uh, operation here. 
And once we finish that, we just change. Uh, the only difference between the addition and division is the, just the final step. We're calling a uh, PySpark addition instead of division. And if we go down the tree recursively, we will see now we hit a table column node. Here, table column is basically a name column. So we, uh, we just get the name out of the node and, ref and reference the column using the name. So that will basically finish the translation. Oh yeah, finally we hit, sorry, finally we hit the bottom node, which is the table node. Uh, here again, this is the name of the table. So we use um, the catalog, the Spark, a PySpark catalog to look up the table. Which is uh, which will result in a PySpark data frame, and we just from there we go bottom up again and and finish the entire translation. Yeah, we use a selection to do the column uh, table column, obviously. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so the previous example is pretty simple. Next is how we translate window. Here I'm not going to show the step by step because ho hopefully you already get the idea but I'm going to just show the uh, end result of this. So go to the next slide. Um, the PySpark translation result of this is pretty similar to the IBIS code. Here, um, the window object is translated into PySpark objects. It's pretty easy because um, uh, those API are pretty similar. And uh, we're translating the window operation, which is in IBIS, it's main.over. In, uh, in PySpark, it's also Ming dot over. So these are pretty straightforward. So finally, we uh, trust and mutate. So yeah, that's the result for the window. And now let's look at the aggregation. Aggregation is actually also pretty straightforward, not surprisingly. Here we're translating uh, the main and max function into uh, Spark functions, main and max, the only difference is in IBUS, main and max are, uh, are members of the column object. In PySpark, those are standalone function that takes a column object. Other than that, those are the same. That's the result of the aggregation. So pretty straightforward. And the, the point here is implementing a backend is not that difficult. Um, the PySpark backend in total is about um, 1,500 lines of code. And comparing to the total amount of code in the IBIS library, that's not a lot. And implementing those are usually pretty straightforward. There's a, uh, pretty, for example, it's pretty clear how to translate a uh, table column and addition and all that. And uh, next, I want to show some uh, more interesting examples in the translation. And this highlights, this actually highlights the motivation of uh, having this translation layer in, in the first place. For example, here I'm doing a rank over window operation. And let me show you the result of the PySpark translation. It's a little bit complicated than, than before. Here we first are taking, uh, we, have, we, we cast the type to long, and we also need a minus uh, to, to uh, subtract by one because the, the starting point of the rank is different uh, between IBIS and PySpark. So, the point of this is because we, um, we as library authors can fix those things, the users don't need to ever worry about, for example, the off by one error or the different D type uh, error between those two things. And the final example I want to show here is a operand called not any in IBIS. And when we translate this node, we find there's no not any um, function in, in PySpark. So, we spend a little bit of time figuring out a, a sort of a trick is to use the max function, which if you have a column of that consists of any true values, the max of that will be true because you know, I guess true is greater than false. And uh, then this is basically um, how you would do uh, not any operation in PySpark. Again, as a user, you don't really want to figure this out, but um, by implementing this into the library, we take care of this for the users. So the, the only thing the user needs to remember is to use the not any to do this logical operation. Yeah, again, this is a no direct translation rule. So that brings us pretty close to the end of the talk. Before uh, I go to conclusion, just a quick recap. So far we have talked about 
concepts of um, execution and expression, separation of concern, and see how that helps us in the original problem. IPOS, which is a, a library to implement these ideas. So if you get up the talk with a few things to remember, I think here are what I think are most important. First, I think the first thing I think is very important is the idea of separation of concern, the idea of separating expression and, exp uh, and execution. And again, this is an idea borrowed from SQL and it's an extremely powerful one, which I think in a lot of the cases we show by um, changing from between pandas to Spark, uh, because we don't have this um, unified expression language, we have to rewrite a lot of code just to make it faster, which is suboptimal. Ideally, we want to just like we want to uh, switch to another execution by um, just similar to how we switch to another SQL backend. It's usually uh, much easier to uh, compare to rewriting your entire code. The second thing I want to sort of highlight here is so far we talk a lot about pandas and Spark, but just to remind ourselves, those are not on the only things. Maybe that's the most popular things today, but there are very smart people trying to write new versions of pandas or new versions of a Spark. So once those things come out or maybe the next version of distributed data frames or GPU data frames becomes mature and we want to use it, we don't want to rewrite the code. We want to have a way to switch our existing analysis code and take advantage of the newer and the faster backends. And that's the power of IBIS is this library allows you to achieve that. So in the future, you don't need to worry about rewriting the code again. So that will conclude my talk. And uh, thanks for coming again. Hopefully this is helpful to you. Now we are open to questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>